Hey y'all, my name is Tori. I'm the adult and teen programmer at Cold Spring, and today I'm going to be talking to you guys about Pugmire. Pugmire is a tabletop RPG system set in a distant future where humans have vanished and dogs have inherited the earth as one of the most common species of people. This tabletop system works kind of similarly to Dungeons and Dragons, if you're familiar with that, in terms of mechanics and player characters, but it's a lot more simplified, which makes it a really great system for anybody who is just starting out with tabletops, but feel a little bit intimidated by all of the source material and options in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, what's really great about Pugmire is that everything you need to get started is in this one book, um, it's got a section for players to learn how to make characters, it's got a section for um, what this system calls guides, the people who tell the story and take the characters along, and it's even got a system, or it's got the beginning of an adventure in the back. Um, it's really simple, it's really great, and I'm excited to tell you guys about it. So in this video I'm mostly going to be talking about Pugmire from the player character's point of view, how to make a character and how to play the game, although I'll go a little bit over what the guide needs to know for playing the game if you decide that you want to tell the adventure. Um, something really great about the Pugmire book that I enjoy is, first of all, chapters 1 through 4 are about player characters and how to make characters and how to play the game. Chapters 5 through 8 are information for the guide, so things like how to tell the story, here's some information on enemies, here's some information on masterworks, and then chapter 9 is the beginning of an adventure. It's a short little um, adventure that you can take the player characters on in the beginning. Something I really love about this book is that throughout the um, explanations of the rules and everything, you have two little guides that help you, Princess Yasha Pug and Pan Dachshund. They'll give you information and examples of what they mean in the rules and um, how to play the game. Um, but I will be going over how to make a character and then how to go through combat and a little bit about the world building of Pugmire. So to start making a character in Pugmire, all you need are a character sheet, which you can print for free from the Pugmire website. It's double-sided, or it is in the back of the Pugmire book that you can copy it out of if you have the book. You'll need a pencil and a regular set of polyhedral dice that you can get from most game stores. Um, they do recommend having do two D20s, but you can totally get by with just one. Pugmire also has some ready-made characters in the beginning of this chapter two that you can start playing as if you're not quite ready to make your own character. And they have basically the entire character sheet right here. But we're gonna go over how to make one of these characters um, following the book's guide for making one of these pre-made characters. So Pugmire has a pretty easy step-by-step -step process for making your character. First, you'll choose a calling, which is what your character does like in their livelihood. You'll choose a breed and a family, or you can choose to play a mutt. You choose a background. You, choose, you assign your ability scores based on their breed and mark primary abilities. You calculate the modifiers, stamina dice, stamina points, and proficiency bonus. You write down your skills based on your background and calling, all of the tricks, all of your equipment, your background, and your calling. And then you calculate defense, initiative, and speed, choose your personality traits, and then name your dog and write their story. We're going to go over what all of those words mean, and we'll start with callings. In Pugmire, there are six callings. Artisans, guardians, hunters, ratters, and shepherds, and strays. You'll notice on each calling page, they give you different information about them. They give you six types of dogs that are generally called to this calling, what a typical dog of this calling is like, their view on the code, which is the code of man. Um, I'll explain that in a minute. And their view on other callings. So this is generally how people from, say, this calling, the strays, feel about artisans. Um, you don't have to stick to any of these feelings. It is totally up to you, but this is suggestions that give you a starting place for what your character is like. It goes through the steps of character creation in terms of this specific calling, and you can roll d6s for any of these that you're not sure about, um, and then 
the first tricks that your character will learn based on this calling. So just a quick rundown of each of the callings. Artisans are magic users who have a specific focus, usually an artifact or a masterwork um, left over from when humans were on the earth. So they cast magic using a special item. Guardians are warriors. Um, they keep the peace. They follow some sort of code, whether it's their own or others. Hunters um, explore the wild places. They kind of move back and forth between the civilization of Pogmire and the wilderness. Um, so they don't really fit into one specific place. They are more likely to um, be exploring than somebody who stays in the city most of the time. Ratters are like rogues. They are in sort of the urban, they're, um, this book describes them as the urban cousins of hunters, which I think is a really great way of explaining it. Um, hunters explore out in the wilderness and then come back to the city. Ratters do the same thing inside the dog kingdoms and um, are kind of like rogues, like I said. Shepherds are also magic users but their magic comes from their faith in mankind. Um, so they are more, if you play other RPG systems, kind of like clerics. They can cast magic, but it comes from their prayers. And then strays are um, dogs that are mostly outside of civilization. Um, they've decided they don't want to live in the city and follow the rules there, so they go off and do their own thing. Um, this doesn't mean that they aren't friendly with other dogs. Um, it's just that they've decided to live outside of the main civilization. The second uh, character trait that you pick out for your dog is its breed. Now, breeds are more like general families of different dogs that have developed similar traits. So as you can see with companion dogs, they're all kind of smallish dogs. But that doesn't mean you couldn't have a big dog that's a companion. Um, these are examples of family names, so like dogs that you could recognize, like a pug or a Pomeranian. But if you don't see a breed listed in any of these, or say you want to play like a German Shepherd who is a can companion, you can totally do that. Um, they say in the lore that it's not uncommon for dogs of different families to mix or adopt each other into the families. Um, so we're going to go through, there's seven different breeds of dogs, and they each have different traits and bonuses. So the first one is companion dogs. They're small and social dogs. Um, they can be found all over. And um, so like Princess Yasha is from the Pug family, which is one of the ruling families of Pugmire. Fettles are tenacious dogs. They are... Um, very resistant to injury. You can see they have a plus two to constitution, which means they're a little harder to hurt and they're a little harder to make sick. Herders are um, family dogs known for wisdom and insight. Um, they tend to be noble um, and advisors, and they want to help with educating others, which is why they get the ability plus two to wisdom. Pointers, um, they value intelligence over other qualities. Um, they work well with like dogs that use arcane skills, um, but, and they are good at solving problems. So as you can see, they get the plus two to intelligence. Runners are really fast dogs. They excel um, with requiring a keen eye and a steady paw. Um, and they get a plus two de dexterity, so they move around a lot easier than other dogs. Workers are strong dogs. Um, they get the plus two to strength bonus. They are work hard, they value strength, they're warriors and builders, and can be a little stubborn at times. And then mutts are a mix of different dogs. They are, um, don't have a collection of bloodlines like the other breeds but they're dogs without any clear lineage. They might be dogs where their parents come from different breeds, or they may have just decided to leave the families and they've decided that they don't want to align with any particular family. Um, they don't have any family names, um, so you can either pick Mutt or just no none at all. 
and because they don't have any particular bonus, they get plus one to any two abilities that you choose. So let's say you want a dog that is strong and smart, you could add your plus one to strength and your plus one to intelligence. This is opposed to plus two to any specific ability that the other ones have. So they're a little more versatile. And then we get into backgrounds. Backgrounds are what they sound like. They are where your character comes from and they affect the skills and tricks that the dog has, as well as things that they carry, uh, um, different equipment or clothes that they have. Um, as you can see, um, these are the different backgrounds. They've kept it pretty simple. There's Acolyte, Common Folk, Criminal, Free Dog, Merchant, Noble, Sage, and Soldier. So you pick one of these and you can use it to either um, enhance some trick or trait of your dog's breed or calling, or you can use it to make your character more well-rounded. Um, it is entirely up to so you. So Pugmire has six main ability scores. So these are the things that you'll roll um, to help see if your character can do something in the game. So there is strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, and wisdom. Strength is like it, um, if your character can pick something up that's heavy or if they can hit really hard. Dexterity is how well your character moves. So if they're particularly fast or find it easy to jump from point A to point B. Constitution is how hard it is to hurt your character or if they don't fall to poison very easily. Intelligence is how smart your dog is. Um, wisdom is similar, but it's more like what they know. And charisma is how friendly they are, if they can get people to like them really easily. Um, to determine your character's ability score, you start with these basic numbers, 15, 14, 13, 10, 12 and 8 and then um, you use those to calculate your modifier so here you can see an example where this character's scores are here they've added any bonuses so like um, your breed gives you plus two or in the case of the mutts plus one to two different ones and then you determine your modifier using this chart here so you can see here, this uh, dog has a strength of 12. So you go down here, a strength of 12 is a plus one. Um, I'll go over how this applies to how you play in a little bit, but it's pretty easy to figure out. The primary abilities of any of the uh, dogs are listed here by their breed, or no, this is by their calling. And this gives them advantage on saves so their scores come in handy with the rolls and the saves. So this is like if they're getting attacked or they've fallen into a trap and they need to get out of the way, they would roll a dexterity save at the um, order of the guide who is telling the story. So here's a chart that um, goes over the different callings and which primary abilities they have. So this gives them um, a proficiency bonus. So it starts with plus two at the first level and then every time it goes up whenever you level up so this means that if so here this dog has proficiency in intelligence if they had to make an intelligence saving throw it would be their um, intelligence modifier which is plus two plus their proficiency bonus which is plus two as well. So then we get to add plus four to any saving throws that they make. So the next thing that you're figuring out is the stamina points. And stamina points are like your dog's health. Um, this is based on their calling and you can see the chart here. So for example, ratters start with eight plus their constitution modifier. So this dog over here has a constitution modifier of plus two. So if they were a ratter, it would be eight plus two. So they would start out with 12 or 10 stamina points. This also determines what kind of stamina dice that they get. So this is dice that they can roll whenever they're taking a smaller rest to earn back a certain amount of stamina points. You start with one at level one and you get an extra dice at each level. So at level one, a ratter gets 1d8 of stamina dice. So if they're taking a short rest, they can roll um, 1d8, which is um, your eight-sided dice, to see how many hit points they earn back that way. 
So we talked about proficiency bonus a little bit in terms of saving throws, but your proficiency bonus can also be added to different types of attack rolls with certain weapons or saving throws based on difficulties for spells. Um, this depends on your dog and the different tricks you take, which we'll talk about here in a second. But first we're going to talk about the skills. Skills are things that your dog is good at. They get two skills automatically based on the background that you pick for them, and then they get to pick any two skill from this set depending on what their calling is. Most of the skills fall under one of these certain ability scores, and um, they allow you to apply a proficiency bonus to certain situations. So for example, with the criminal background, you get the skill Sneak. Sneak falls under the Dexterity ability, and it covers your character's ability to conceal themselves from enemies, slip away without being noticed, sneak past guards, or conceal something on him. So if your dog is in a situation where they're trying to get into a party, but they don't have an invitation, and they're trying to sneak past the guards of the party, if your um, guide has you roll to see if you succeed in that, you would check for your skills, and you would see that you have sneak and then you would get to add your proficiency bonus, which starts at plus two for level one, to that roll to um, increase your odds of succeeding. Tricks are kind of similar to skills in that they are things that your dog is really good at. Um, their special abilities and powers based on your dog's background and their calling and their breed. Um, so certain ones you get, you get um, easier than others. So for example, here you can see the callings and they have aptitude tricks that they can learn. Um, you get one from your calling and uh, one from your breed automatically, I believe. And you can also refine your tricks. So you can see back here, um, this is the fast talk trick. And when you get it automatically, when you get it at first, this is the description you'll go for. When you level up, you can choose to refine the fast talk trick, and you can pick one of these effects to refine it. You don't have to go in any specific order with these, you can just pick whichever one you want. And this influences, like, like your skills, this influences your roles and your abilities and things that you can do. So now we're going to talk about your dog's equipment. Your equipment is carried in their rucksack, and the equipment that they have depends on their background and their calling. Um, that'll give you an idea of the armor that they have, the weapons that they could have, the um, amount of money that they have, which money in this game is plastic coins, which is awesome in my opinion. I think that's so funny. And here you can see a rundown of the different types of weapons. There are three types of weapons uh, for the most part. There's regular weapons, finesse weapons, and ranged weapons. Regular weapons, they don't have anything specific next to them. They use strength for attack, so you would roll a strength roll to attack. Um, uh, ranged weapons, you roll dexterity, and then finesse weapons, you would, can roll either dexterity or strength, whichever you prefer. Um, and those will, it will give you that detail, like here you can see this crossbow is a ranged weapon. So it'll tell you that here, and then this is how you roll the damage. The damage roll is the dice, and then this is the type of damage. The type of damage is important because certain enemies or characters may be particularly weak to a certain amount of damage, or a certain type of damage, or they may be um, strong against or even immune to certain types of damages. So that helps you determine how much um, damage the opponent takes whenever you roll. Now that we've decided your dog's um, backgrounds, your calling, your breed, and figured out what kind of items that they have in their rug set, you can determine your dog's defense, initiative, and speed. Your defense determines how well they avoid being wounded in battle. So um, this depends on your dexterity, if you have a shield, or if you have a dagger. Um, there are some spells and tricks that can give you a different way to calculate your dog's defense. So there might be a trick that can tell you um, you can use your strength or your constitution instead of your dexterity. But for most dogs, the defense is going to be um, 10 plus the dexterity modifier. Um, plus anything else from shield or armor. The initiative determines how fast they uh, enter the fight whenever you're in combat. 
Um, this will move on a little uh, later because there are certain things that affect it. But uh, for the most part, it's equal to your dexterity modifier. So that number that we figured out earlier. And then your speed is how far your dog can move during their turn in combat. So um, they can't, so dogs have two ways of moving for the most part. They can move on two legs, which most dogs can move 30 feet per turn on two legs, or they can move on all four legs. This helps them go a little bit faster and most dogs can move 40 feet per turn on four legs. Um, certain types of things like armor can make them move a little slower since it's heavy. Um, that's something you would figure out in the aptitude. And then you would figure out your dog's personality traits. So personality traits help you decide how you're going to role play your dog. And um, it has an ideal, a bond, and a flaw. You can make these up as you go along, um, but you can also roll a d6 on this table if you're not sure what to pick. So an ideal is something that drives the dog. It is what they believe in. It might be something like an ethical ideal or part of their belief system. A bond is how this dog um, connects to the world, like um, a specific character, a place, or an organization, and it helps motivate the dog um, just like the ideal does. And a flaw is some sort of weakness. No dog is without something that gets them into trouble or um, might hold them back a little bit. So you can choose each of these from these tables or make it up as you go along, and then you pick the name and story. So you write a backstory for your character. You can use the background and the calling and the breed to help influence this, or you can just completely make it up. Um, you know, just depend on, um, asking your guide for approval of anything that might be completely out of whack but have fun with it and do whatever you want. So just to give you guys an example of how to fill out a character sheet now that we've talked about everything that goes on it, we're gonna follow Princess Yasha's example of how to make a character sheet for her friend Alistair Afghan. This way I can give you guys a um, more visual understanding of the character sheet and what it looks like as you're filling it out. So first we pick our calling, breed, and family and background for the dog. So here you can see that Princess Yasha has Alistair Afghan. He's an artisan, level one. His breed is runner. His family is Afghan and his background is a noble. So we'll fill, fill that up right here. Um, I do recommend filling out your character sheet with a pencil because you're gonna be changing numbers sometimes either when you add a trick or a um, skill or when you're leveling up. So I'm going to fill that out and get right back. So now that we've determined Alistair's breed, family, background, and calling, we give him his ability scores. So Princess Yasha goes over here, her reason for deciding things. So he's smart, so she puts his 15 in intelligence, which she'll put right here. Um, she decides to put his wisdom in t as 10. And his dexterity is eight because he's not very wise and he's not, he's a little clumsy. So that's why she decided to use those numbers there. Um, it would help if I put the numbers in the right spot. So they go in the little yellow bubbles. So now she has a 14, 13, and 12. These are pretty similar numbers, so you can put them wherever, and she put those um, in Constitution, um, Charisma, and Strength. And then you look at these and decide if they give any sort of bonuses. So as she points out, Alistair is a runner, so they get plus two to the Dexterity score. So with Dexterity, you change that eight, to a 10 since he's a runner. So then we fill out the modifiers. So we can look at this chart again that shows us what modifiers go with what scores. So a strength of 12 gets plus one. Dexterity of 10 gets zero. Constitution of 14 gets plus two. Intelligence of 15 gets plus two. A wisdom of 10 also gets zero, 
and a charisma of 13 gets plus one. So now we know what to add whenever we have to roll for any of those particular things. Next, we figure out his primary abilities. These are based on callings and they're right here. So we fill in the bubble for whichever primary abilities that Alistair has. And this is where we determine what his proficiency bonus goes towards. So he is a artisan. So he gets his primary abilities are charisma and intelligence. So we cover, color those in so we know which ones are his primary abilities. And then we add his proficiency bonus to these saving throws, which is plus two. Um, so since he's a level one. So otherwise it stays the same as over here. So strength stays plus one, dexterity stays zero, constitution goes to plus two, and then intelligence is plus two, but because he gets that proficiency bonus, it goes to plus four. Wisdom stays at zero, and charisma goes from plus one here to plus three here. So these are the saving throws. So um, you'll, if you have to roll the saving throw, you'll add these numbers to your dice rather than these numbers. We're gonna go back a page to determine his stamina and stamina dice. Now these are right here. Stamina is based on his calling. So his calling is an artisan. So we go to the chart here, his artisan, it's six plus his constitution modifier. So his constitution modifier is two, so he gets eight stamina points to begin with. And the way that this works is if he lose any hit points, you'll, uh, stamina points, you'll erase this number and add it. So if he gets attacked and loses two in the attack, you'll erase this and put a six. So you know he has a total of eight, but he currently has six. His stamina dice, which are those dice that he can roll during a rest to regain some hit points, um, is also a d6. So you'll write that right here. And since he's a level one, he gets one d6. And we'll keep going in just a second. So the next thing we're figuring out is Alistair's skills. So these are based on the background and calling. So since Alistair is a noble, he knows about history and is very persuasive. So the skills that he gets is no history, and persuade. And again, um, the uh, skills are listed, or these are on this page, and these have a little more detail about um, what Alistair those also gets two more from the calling list, so that is on page 67. And since he's an artisan, he gets to pick two from any of these. Princess Yasha picked out no arcana and no culture for him. So we'll fill that in as well. So the next thing we pick out is the tricks, which are actually on the back of the character sheet. And Princess Yasha picks these for them. Since he's a runner, he gets a speedy runner. Since he's a noble, he gets good breeding. And as an artisan, he gets a simple weapon aptitude and light armor aptitude. And then you can choose between encouragement and focus magic based on his background. Um, Yasha decides to do focus magic, um, which helps you pick out spells, which we'll do in a minute. And then she suggests writing down the page number for each of these since they do different stuff. That way you don't have to memorize them or write it all down. You can reference it at a different point. You can totally just write them down either on here or on note cards or in a special notebook so that you don't have to flip back and forth through the book all the time. So we're gonna write those down and then get back to his equipment. So now we're back on the front of the sheet and we're gonna go over his rucksack and equipment. So as you can see here, it's determined by his calling. So he's an artisan, so he gets certain things based on that and his, and his background. So he's a noble and he gets certain things based on that. And here is the list. These are all back on the other pages about the backgrounds and nobles and each one gets different things. Um, this is also where you would find out what type of armor he's wearing. And so if that affects his um, movement and his, uh, defense and things like that, which we'll do in a second. And it's also where you figure out if he has any weapons. So he gets one weapon um, and he 
one simple weapon. So she picked a dagger for that. So that's where you would add that up here to the attack roll and things. He, since he's a magic user, he won't be using it very often, but it's still good to write it down just in case. So I'm gonna fill those in and then we'll go over his defense initiative and speed. Really quick before moving on to the defense initiative and speed, I wanted to point out money. So as you can see with Alistair's, he has many plastic coins. Most backgrounds will let you know if you have few, some, or many plastic coins. Money in this game isn't very strict. You're not going to told you have 12 coins. Um, what you'll do is you get told if you have few, some, or many, and then in any situation where you're buying something or trying to trade for something, your guide can either decide that you want this thing, it would be kind of expensive because you have many plastic coins based on your background, they decide that, yes, you can afford it, you do get it. Or they may have you roll. Um, it's up to the guide um, and uh, you as the player and the guide can converse about these things. You can tell why you think that you should be able to get it. They can tell you why they don't think or they do think. Um, but that's how money works in this game. It's a lot less um, strict than you have so many coins and this means you can buy things worth X amount. So to determine his defense, we look at the items he's wearing and the skills that he has and the tricks that he has. So on the other side of the page, he has the light armor aptitude and he is wearing light armor. So his defense will be 11 plus his dexterity. Now he's not very dexterous, so he doesn't get any extra. So his defense is just 11. Initiative is, like I said earlier, what order people get to move in combat. Um, you will roll a d20 and add this number to it, and then the guide knows who goes in what order. And it is just your dexterity modifier. So once again, Alistair is not very dexterous. His modifier for initiative is zero. And then his speed is determined by his breed and his armor. So because he's a runner, he's a little faster than most, and because he's wearing light armor, it doesn't weigh him down. So based on his runner background, his speed on two legs is 35 and his speed on four legs is 50. So you put two legs on top, four legs on bottom. After this, you're pretty much done with the scores. Um, oh, I've still got to fill in my dagger over here. And then you would pick the personality traits. And then we're going to pick magic and I will explain how magic works in this game. So to finish out Alistair's char character sheet, we need to pick spells for them. Um, spells are on the back side of the page. We need to pick, figure out how many spell slots he has and then pick the spells appropriate to his background or to his calling. So there are two different kinds of spell casters in Pugmire. There are artisans like Alistair and Princess Yasha and then there are the shepherds which are the ones that cast their spells based on their faith in man. Um, you determine spells by its two per level plus the constitution modifier. So Alistair is a level one, so he automatically gets two spell slots, and then his constitution modifier is two. So he gets four spell slots. So each spell um, costs a spell slot whenever it's cast, unless it, is, unless it is one of the three basic spells that they automatically get when picking, um, when taking the aptitude that they, the trick that they need to be able to cast spells. So, um, we'll, we'll go through and look, um, and here's a list of spells for artisans and a spells for shepherds. And then it has the descriptions in alphabetical order. So um, the basic spells that he gets as an artisan are Elemental Ray, Magic Paw, and Smell Magic. And then as a level one character, he gets to pick from the level one spells. And he picks, I think, two spells. Yeah, two first level spells. Um, and then you'll write them here and along with either the description if you want to write it down or the page number that the spell is on. So I'm going to fill that out. So when a magic user levels up, they can take more spells 
like up to two per level, or they can refine the spell casting trick that they took, or um, uh, take more spells at the next level. So for example, if they get to the second level, he gets two new spells. And then they can use the improvement to refine his focus magic trick. So that's how he casts his magic with the focus magic trick. And then when he reaches third level, you could potentially um, refine the trick so that he gets to take four spells, not two. However, because he's level three and you've refined the trick for more spells, not higher level spells, you can only still pick level one and level two spells. Now that we have finished Alistair's um, character sheet, which I forgot to fill in the proficiency bonus, which since he is a level one character, he gets plus two. Um, but now that we've finished his character sheet, I'm gonna go over really quick the mechanics of the game. There are three main roles in um, a game, at least as far as the d20 is concerned, which is the 20-sided dice. There's the attack rolls, there's saving throws, and there's ability checks. So your ability check will be something like, you tell your guide that you want your dog to try to climb a wall. Your guide might try to tell you, roll a dexterity check. So you would look at this number here, and using Alistair's character sheet, he doesn't have very good dexterity. You would look at your skills, nothing here really helps him with his dexterity. And you would look at his tricks, none of this really helps him with his dexterity. So you would just roll your d20 and add zero. So your guide will pick a number in their head. Let's say it's a pretty easy wall to climb, there might be some problems, but it's not too terribly difficult. So your guide might have a number in their head and say they have to roll a 10 or higher to successfully climb this wall. So you would roll. So Alistair rolled a six plus zero as his dexterity modifier. So because the difficulty was 10 and he rolled below that, he fails the check. Now, if he had rolled a 14, that would have been above the difficulty and he, he would succeed in climbing the wall. There's two other things that are important when rolling. If they roll a 20, regardless of what they add to it, it's considered an automatic success. This game calls it a triumph. If they roll a one, that is an automatic failure. This game calls it a botch. There may be um, special things that happen if you roll a 20 and there may be damage or things that go terribly wrong if they roll a one. But regardless of modifiers, they could, if it's a 10 and even if your character has a plus 10 modifier somehow, if they roll a one, they fail. Um, the next one is saving throws. These are usually um, rolled in response to an attack. So for example, Alistair has a spell called Thunder Wave. When he is attacking with Thunder Wave, his opponents have to roll a constitution saving throw against um, Alistair's difficulty. So his difficulty is determined as 10, no, it's eight plus his spellcasting modifier. So um, as a shepherd, his spell casting is, I think, let me see. Um, he's an artisan, not a shepherd. So his spell casting is intelligence. So it's eight plus his intelligence, which is two, plus his proficiency, which is two. So the person who he is rolling against has to roll higher than a 12 to succeed. So we're gonna use Alistair as an example. So because it's a constitution saving throw, he would go here, roll, he got another six, plus two is eight. So then because the difficulty for the roll was 12 and he rolled an eight, that would be a failure. And then you would calculate damage based on that. In this case for Thunder Wave, if they had succeeded, they would take half damage, and if they failed, they take full damage. Damage is after an attack, so um, the Thunder Wave attack um, spell uses a 2d8s. So d8s 
are these dice that look like little diamonds. They've got eight sides. And so at a failure, he takes full damage. You roll it twice. So that is seven and five. So that is um, 12, which is a lot of damage. The last roll that we're going to go over is an attack roll. So this would be something like with a weapon or certain types of spells might require this. And it is a d20 plus whatever that thing uses to attack. So we're going to use Alistair's dagger as an example. So his dagger uses strength as a modifier because it's not a finesse weapon. Um, so we his strength is plus one. So he'll roll a d20 and that is a 16 plus one. So that's a 17. And then he would compare it to the person he's attacking defense. So for example, if the person he was attacking had the same defense as him, a 17 is higher than an 11. So it would hit and then you would roll damage. So daggers do one D4 damage and D4s are these little triangle looking ones. So you would roll one D4 plus zero. So it rolled a four, so the other person would take four points of damage. If a character or an NPC, a non-player character, rolls an attack and it's the same number as the defense, it's like if Alistair had rolled an 11 um, after adding the plus one, so a 10 plus one, um, he would still hit and he would still get to do damage. The very last thing I'm going to be talking about in terms of mechanics for player characters is what to do in a round of battle. So when characters enter battle, the first thing that their gui the guide is going to have them do is roll initiative. So you would roll. So Alistair rolled a 10. His initiative is 0. So his whole initiative roll would be a 10. The guide rolls for any non-player characters or enemies that the party is facing. And then orders everybody from highest going first to lowest going last. Each round is when everybody has taken a turn. So if there are seven people, like four party members and three enemies, once all of those characters have taken their turn, that's when the round ends. When a character takes their turn, they can take one action. And these are the possible actions that they can take. Attack, which is what we've talked about in terms of like using a spell or a weapon. Cast which is using a spell with a casting time of one action. Change, which is repl uh, replace one item in their paws with one in the rucksack. So let's say they're holding a dagger, but they actually want to be holding their sword. That takes an action, so that takes a full turn. Um, they can defend, which means that all attacks against you are at disadvantage until your next turn, which means... Disadvantage and advantage is something we haven't talked about a lot. You would roll two d20s or roll the same one twice. And if you have advantage, you would take the higher number. And if you have disadvantage, you would take the lower number. So if your character takes the defend action, then um, any time an enemy attacked your character, they would have to roll disadvantage. So that was a seven and a 12. They would have to take the seven for the attack, which makes them less likely to hit you. You can disengage, which means moving away from the enemy without them getting to attack you for moving away. You can help an ally, which means that they get advantage on their next roll or ability check before your next turn. So again, you would roll twice if Alistair helped Yasha, for example. On um, Yasha's next attack, she would get to roll twice. So that was a 16 and a nat 20. So that's a triumph. So she would get to take the triumph. Hide, um, you make a dexterity check or um, using the sneak skill specifically to remain unseen or to hide yourself in the middle of battle. You can ready an attack, which is when you say, if X thing happens, I am going to do Y. So the example they give is if a cat gets within feet, five feet of me, I will use my action to attack. So you hold off and then... Um, when that happens, you let the um, you get to attack. Run means you get to move up to twice your speed. So if Alistair decided to run, he could go 70 feet instead of 35. You can search, which is looking through a nearby area, usually using a wisdom check or use. You can use an item or an object. 
There are free actions, which are things that take almost no time at all, like talking or pressing a button or something like that. And then you can sometimes have a bonus action, which um, is the ability of a trick or spell or something that lets you do a second thing during your turn. Um, not everybody automatically gets this. It depends on their spells and their tricks that they've taken. Um, and then some effects will let you regain a reaction. Um, so this is like after they've taken their turn, but bef be before their next turn. So this is like if you are standing here and an enemy is standing here and they try to move away, you get to do an attack of opportunity. That is a reaction. So those are things about, those are the important parts of combat. Um, and your guide will do the rest. Now that we've created the player character and we've gone over the things like the rules of combat, I'm gonna very, very quickly go over the world of Pugmire. This is in the section for um, guides. So um, this is more for the person who is telling the story and leading the party than the people who are playing the game exactly. So like I said at the very beginning, Pugmire is set in a world where humans for whatever reason, have disappeared. You can decide what that is. You can let it stay a mystery. It doesn't really matter. Um, and since humans have disappeared, there are several species of animals that have been what the dogs called uplifted. So they can walk on two legs should they want to. They've gained intelligence. They know how to use items. They have thumbs, which is like the biggest thing. Um, and there are still like regular animals as well. So there are uplifted dogs and then there are canines, which are like four-legged dogs like we think of today. So in this game, there are dogs, which are the main player characters of Pugmire. There are cats, rats, lizards, and badgers. Now the fun thing about Pugmire, there are additional books that you can get called the Monarchies of Mao. And that is where you get to play as cats. And Monarchies of Mao and Pugmire work together. So if you want to learn how to play as a cat, you can do that with Monarchies of Mao and then use it in a Pugmire campaign. So these five different um, animals are the main things that your characters will be interacting with. Um, this goes into the different types of um, interactions they may have. And then there are also monsters, which are things that are deformed or things that are... Um, terrifying creatures that might attack, and then demons in the unseen. So these are the different types of characters um, that your characters might interact with. There are, later on, different types of enemies listed. And this is for the DM so that they know, like, if your characters are going to be fighting a zombie. This gives them the information of how to, what their defense would be, their stamina, all the sorts of things that they can do. All right, y'all, so that is the basics of character creation in Pugmire some of the information about um, the actions that you can take when you're playing, and a little bit about what the guide needs to know. Um, there's definitely more that you can learn. Um, the book definitely goes way more in depth than I did. Um, and you can check out their website to learn more. Um, but I hope you guys give Pugmire a chance. It's a really neat little game. Um, it's super fun. The art is really rad. Um, so yeah, so I hope you guys figure out a dog that you would like to play, find yourself a guide in a party, and get around to playing. Alright, you guys have a great day.